So far we've been looking at limits as x goes to infinity or as y goes to infinity. If you'd like to review these, click here. But now we'll be looking at limits that don't involve infinity. If you're ready, click here. Okay, to start things off, we'll be looking at this function. x squared minus 5x plus 4 divided by x minus 1. First off, what's the domain of this function? Is it all values of x not equal to 1? All x not equal to 0? All x greater than 1? Or all x less than 0? Exactly, the domain of this function is all values of x other than 1, because putting a 1 into this function gives you a 0 in the denominator. Next, try factoring the numerator of this fraction. x squared minus 5x plus 4 equals x minus 1 times x minus what number? If you'd like to review how to multiply and factor polynomials instead, click down here. Right x squared minus 5x plus 4 equals x minus 1 times x minus 4. So let's plug this back into the numerator of our function. Now notice that we have x minus 1 in both the numerator and denominator. We should be able to cancel these out, leaving us with x minus 4. Now which of these lines is the correct graph for this function f of x equals x minus 4? Exactly, this green line is the function x minus 4. But our function up here was not quite x minus 4. We had the x minus 1 in the numerator and denominator, and because x minus 1 is in the denominator, that meant that x equals 1 was not part of this function's domain. That means this function should have a hole in it where there's no output. So which of these is the correct location for this function's hole? Right, the hole is over here, where x equals 1. So you can't put the number 1 into this function. But let's look at inputs very close to 1. As x gets really, really close to 1, what value does this function seem to be approaching? Right, f of x seems to be approaching negative 3. Next, we'll be using narrow tubes to prove that f of x really is approaching negative 3 and not some other value. Here's an interactive graph of the same function we've been looking at, x minus 1 times x minus 4 over x minus 1. We have a vertical tube here centered at x equals 1, and you can change the width, delta, of this tube by dragging these green dots left and right. And we also have a horizontal tube here that has a width of epsilon that you can change by dragging these purple dots up and down. You can also move the entire horizontal tube up and down by dragging this black dot. Now you said that as x gets closer and closer to 1, y seems to get closer and closer to negative 3. Another way to say this is that no matter how narrow we make the horizontal tube centered at negative 3, we should be able to change the width of the vertical tube so that if x is close enough to 1, then that guarantees that y is inside the horizontal tube. In this interactive graph, for a given horizontal tube, when being inside the vertical tube guarantees that f of x is inside the horizontal tube, the vertical tube will turn blue, like this. Let's take this for a spin and see what happens. Let's center the horizontal tube somewhere else, like negative 4. And let's make the tube wide, setting epsilon equal to 2. If we're inside the vertical tube, that doesn't guarantee we're in the horizontal tube, because there's this region up here that's inside the vertical tube, but outside the horizontal tube. How small do we have to make delta so that being inside the vertical tube guarantees we're inside this horizontal tube? So with a horizontal tube centered at negative 4, when epsilon equals 2, if delta is less than 1, then being inside the vertical tube guarantees that the function is inside the horizontal tube. Now let's make the horizontal tube narrower, setting epsilon equal to 0 0.5. When delta equals 1, being inside the vertical tube does not guarantee that we're inside the horizontal tube because this part of the function here is outside the horizontal tube. How small does delta have to be to guarantee that if we're inside the vertical tube, we're inside this horizontal tube? 
Exactly. When the horizontal tube centered at negative 4 is narrow enough, there's no vertical tube centered at x equals 1 such that being in the vertical tube guarantees being inside the horizontal tube. That means as x approaches 1, this function is not approaching negative 4. OK, let's put negative 3 to the test. So let's center the horizontal tube at y equals negative 3, and let's keep epsilon equal to 0 0.5. How narrow does the vertical tube have to be so that being inside the vertical tube guarantees that the function is inside this horizontal tube? Right. When epsilon equals 0 0.5, if delta is anything less than 0 0.5, then being inside the vertical tube guarantees the function is inside the horizontal tube. When the horizontal tube is centered at negative 3, this works even as we make the horizontal tube narrower and narrower. Let's set epsilon to 0 0.2. Then if we make delta less than 0 0.2, then the tube turns blue again. Being in the vertical tube guarantees we're in the horizontal tube. So when the horizontal tube is centered at negative 3, no matter how narrow you make the horizontal tube, you can always find a vertical tube centered at 1 so that being inside the vertical tube guarantees the function is inside the horizontal tube. So here's our function again. As x gets closer and closer to 1, f of x gets closer and closer to negative 3. Here's how we've been saying it using our horizontal and vertical tubes. No matter how narrow we make the horizontal tube, squeezing it around negative 3, we can always find a vertical tube such that if x is inside the vertical tube, then f of x is inside the horizontal tube, even if this horizontal tube is really, really narrow. At this point, let's rewrite this statement a little more mathematically. We've been calling the width of the vertical tube delta, and we've been calling the width of the horizontal tube epsilon. Now another way of saying no matter how narrow we make the horizontal tube, is to say that its width, epsilon, can have any value greater than zero. Epsilon can be big, or epsilon can be teeny tiny, just a little greater than zero, in which case the horizontal tube is really narrow. And another way to say we can find a vertical tube is to say that it has some width delta. So let's take another quick look at this statement. We're saying that for any epsilon you pick, meaning whatever width you pick for this horizontal tube, even if epsilon is really, really small, there's a value of delta, meaning there's a width of the vertical tube, so that if x is inside the vertical tube centered at 1, then f of x is inside the horizontal tube centered at negative 3. Next, let's look at this statement here. For a vertical tube of width delta and centered at x equals 1, what's an equivalent way to say that x is inside this tube? Exactly. This is the same as saying that 1 minus delta is less than x, which is less than 1 plus delta. And let's look at this last line here. What's an equivalent way to say that f of x is inside the tube of width epsilon centered at y equals negative 3? Right. Being in the horizontal tube is the same as saying that negative 3 minus epsilon is less than f of x, which is less than negative 3 plus epsilon. So now we have all the pieces we need. This statement up here is the definitive way in mathematics to say that this function approaches negative 3 as x approaches 1. For any epsilon greater than 0, even if epsilon is really, really small, there's a delta such that if x is inside the tube of width delta centered at 1, then f of x is inside a tube of width epsilon centered at negative 3. So as epsilon gets smaller and smaller around negative 3, there's a region or neighborhood of points around x equals 1 that always have outputs inside the horizontal tube. Now this statement has a lot of parts, each of which requires a bit of thought. In math, a shorter way to write this down is like this, which can be read aloud as the limit of f of x as x approaches 1 is negative 3. This says that as x gets really, really close to 1, f of x gets really, really close to negative 3. These two statements up here are completely equivalent, and when we write a limit like this, we actually mean this whole statement over here.
but that's a lot to think about and write down, so we'll be sticking with this way of writing limits when we can. Let's also write down the general statement for a limit. Suppose we're centering our vertical tube around x equals a, and the horizontal tube around y equals b. Then we can replace the 1's up here with a's, and the negative 3's with b's. And let's do the same thing in this limit statement over here. So here's the formal definition for what it means to take a limit of f of x as x approaches a. But instead of drawing tubes, you'll typically evaluate limits using a few tricks and rules, or by graphing the function. Try evaluating this limit, the limit of x minus 2 times x plus 3 over x plus 3, as x approaches negative 3. Don't worry about drawing horizontal or vertical tubes at this point. Instead, look for a way to simplify this function, or you can try graphing it and seeing what happens as x approaches negative 3. And if you get stuck, then click over here. Okay, let's take a careful look at this function inside this limit statement. We have x plus 3 in the numerator and another x plus 3 in the denominator. If we cancel them out, we get x minus 2. So this function looks just like x minus 2, except we can't put a negative 3 into this function because that would make the denominator 0. So which of these is the correct graph for this function? Nicely done. Here's the correct graph. It's exactly like the graph of y equals x minus 2, except there's a hole where x equals negative 3. So while you can't put negative 3 into this function, you can put in points very close to negative 3. And at these points, this function behaves just like the function x minus 2. So as x gets very, very close to negative 3, what value does f of x approach? Precisely, as x gets very close to negative 3, the output of this function approaches the y-coordinate of the hole down here, which is the y-coordinate of the line y equals x minus 2 when x equals negative 3. And that, as you found, is negative 5. Let's look at one more limit. What's the limit of x squared as x approaches 2? Here's a graph of the function x squared, and for this function, there are no holes or discontinuities. Well done! As x gets really, really close to 2, x squared gets really, really close to 4. It so happens that this function, x squared, equals 4 when x equals 2. But this limit statement is not saying anything about what x squared actually equals when x equals exactly 2. It's just saying that as x gets closer and closer to 2, x squared gets closer and closer to 4.